Welcome back this Wednesday to our Old Testament study in the book of Ruth. I pray that you each had a wonderful resurrection weekend as we celebrated what Christ did for us on the cross and what the empty tomb means for us even today. If you missed one of those services, you can go to watchhbclynchburg.com, and I'd encourage you to watch it and join with us in song and in praise and in the opening of God's Word. Let's pray as we get back into the text today and over today, Wednesday, tomorrow, Thursday, and Friday, we're going to finish up the story of Ruth. Let's pray. Father, thank you for my brothers and sisters in Christ and my friends who may be joining us from wherever they are at. Thank you that no matter who we are, that we can come to you, that you are not a respecter of persons, but rather you look upon the heart and that salvation is open to all. And I pray, O oh God, that you would help us to realize what you've done on the cross and what the empty tomb means. I also pray that you would help us to continue to have understanding of your providence and kindness in history. And I pray that you would guide us even as we get into the final passages here in the Old Testament book of Ruth. We ask your blessing upon this day. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Ruth chapter 4, beginning in verse 7. Now remember where we've come from. It's been a few days. But Ruth and Naomi have journeyed from Moab, come back to Bethlehem, Naomi's hometown. They've experienced hardship and grief, and yet God has been right there with them through it all. Where they were hoping to find some basic levels of provision, they've been met instead through Boaz at the hand of God, but using Boaz as that instrument of grace, and they have received overflowing abundance, kindness, and mercy. We're going to see the story come to a conclusion as Boaz goes through what may seem to us in the West a rather peculiar tradition. What does it mean? Let's take a look beginning in verse 7. Now this was the custom in former times in Israel concerning redeeming and exchanging. To confirm a transaction, the one drew off his sandal and gave it to the other. And this was the manner of attesting in Israel. So when the Redeemer said to Boaz, Buy it for yourself, he drew off his sandal. Then Boaz said to the elders and all the people, You are witnesses this day that I have brought from the hand, bought from the hand of Naomi all that belonged to Elimelech and all that belonged to Chilion and Melon. Also Ruth the Moabite, the widow of Melon, I have brought to be my wife, or bought to be my wife, to perpetuate the name of the dead in his inheritance, that the name of the dead may not be cut off from among his brothers and from the gate of his native place. You are witnesses this day. Then all the people who were at the gate and the elders said, We are witnesses. May the Lord make the woman who is coming into your house like Rachel and Leah, who together built up the house of Israel. May you act worthily in Epaphrathah and be renowned in Bethlehem. And may your house be like the house of Perez, whom Tamar bore to Judah, because of the offspring the Lord will give you by this young woman. Now we come to a little bit of an odd transaction that involves a sandal. Now what has just happened? Remember Ruth at the instruction of Naomi went to Boaz by night so as not to jeopardize their reputations. And what amounts to a marriage proposal, Ruth presented herself before Boaz, something that Boaz readily desired as well. And so that day he went and sought to make everything right, to buy back the land for Naomi and then also to secure Ruth as his wife. But before that could take place, there had to be a transaction. You see, there was a relative that was nearer than Boaz in the place to redeem the land for Naomi. Now, the question of Ruth, remember from last time or last week when we talked, this is probably not a strict leveret marriage. It doesn't fall into exactly the parameters set forth in the book of Deuteronomy. So it is likely that Boaz is looking to redeem the land, but then also to announce to everybody that he plans on marrying Ruth. Upon hearing this, the other redeemer relinquishes rights to renew or to redeem the land because he knows that if Ruth has a child in the line of Elimelech, once that child is born, the land would revert to Ruth's line. And so he doesn't want to jeopardize his inheritance. So we have a transaction now that takes place, a transaction that secures the redemption of the land, but also secures symbolically the redemption of Ruth the Moabitess. Now, the custom, it says here, this was the custom in former times. Another hint as well that this is more of a custom rather than a strict, strict keeping of the leveret law that we find in the book of Deuteronomy. 
Now, how do we understand ancient customs and how do we understand them in the context of the story? Well, one thing that is helpful to look at are our current day cultures that come from the line of these ancient traditions. So you look at Middle Eastern cultures and see how they practice things today. And it can give us some limited guidance for how to look back on the scriptures, specifically through the eyes of an honor-shame culture, those values that that culture prizes. Well, in the Middle Eastern context today, the foot has actually tremendous symbolism. Uh, many Muslims will not put, or not many, all Muslims by tradition will not put their Quran on the floor next to the feet because that symbolizes that something that you disdain. But the foot also symbolized a place of ownership or something that you own. To put your foot on the land, for instance, says this land belongs to me. Now that's in modern day Middle Eastern culture. It's not always helpful to look, go back 2,000 years or 3,000 years in this case because cultures do change over time. So what other evidence can we look at? There were some tablets that were discovered in the Middle East called the Nuzi tablets, about 6,500 uh, cuneiform, which are, are writings impressed in clay tablets, baked so they're hardened and then stored as a record. Well, these were discovered by archaeologists and there was lots of accounts of economic, cultural things in these tablets. And this is what was written on one of these, what are called the Nuzi texts. So to validate a transfer of real estate, the old owner would lift up his foot from the property and place the new owner's foot on it. So that is from the Newsy text, demonstrating the significance of placing one's foot. In the Old Testament as well, to set foot on the land was associated with ownership. And therefore, as we look at the book of Ruth, we can draw some conclusions based upon what it says here as a custom that likewise, likewise it was a symbol of transaction, a symbol of ownership, and a symbol of, of one's right to the land. So again, some evidences that we build in, into a culture that really is so far different than our own. But note this, and this is the theological importance, that there had to be a transaction some sort of cost, some sort of payment given, and a confirmation of that transaction for Ruth to be brought under the protection of Boaz and for Naomi to be provided for. And then after the Redeemer took off his sandal uh, and, and they, they, they transferred that, um, then it says that uh, Boaz, he said to Boaz, buy it yourself. And Boaz then said to the people, now by this time, we know that he gathered the elders in chapter 2, but now he speaks to them and to the people. So a crowd has gathered to witness the tra this transaction and to see what's going to happen. So the witnesses look on and Boaz says, you can all attest to the fact of this transaction. And this transaction secures Naomi's provision, but it also secures Ruth to be my wife. So the witnesses confirm the transaction. Now, what does Ruth get? Naomi first, sorry, what does Naomi get? She gets provision and a reestablishment of her name among her people. What does Ruth get? She becomes Boaz's wife, not at this very moment, but by declaration, this is as good as a marriage covenant. It says, I have bought her to be my wife, down in verse 10. So this woman who is a foreigner, who is an outsider, comes into the people of Israel finds acceptance, grace, and mercy at the hand of Boaz. Of course, this is God guiding all of it. Draws her in to that protection. And then now as a result of Boaz's transaction, he has now acquired Ruth to be his covenant spouse, to be under his protection. That Ruth now belongs to him. He belongs to her. She's under his protection. He is under she is under his love. There, there's a beautiful theological truth going on here, and I hope you'll stay with me as we kind of draw it out. He then says, I want to do this also so that the name of Malon may not be lost. Now, it's interesting. In his humility, not only to care for Ruth, but out of his love for her, which remember, there's a beautiful love story going on. But also in his humility, he's looking to perpetuate the name of Ruth's former husband. Interestingly enough, because of his humility and godliness, who does history remember? Do we remember Malon? No, we, we actually don't. What we remember is Boaz, through whom would come King David, through whom would come the Messiah himself.
Now the people, when they witness all of the, these things, they break out in blessing and pronouncement and say to uh, Boaz and to the elders gathered around, they say, may the Lord make this woman who is coming into your house like Rachel and Leah. Rachel and Leah, the, the wives of Jacob, who birthed um, through some help with their handmaidens, but uh, through them came uh, the 12 tribes of Israel. They were the builders of the house of Israel. So there's great significance in the names they're choosing. And again, interestingly enough, it is through Ruth who will come King David, who will literally build the kingdom of Israel and through whom will come the people of God, the, the people that God has chosen for himself through Jesus Christ. And then it says, may you act worthily in Epaphratha and renowned in Bethlehem. May your name be known. And indeed, history has remembered their name. And verse 12, may your house be like the house of Perez, of whom Tamar bore to Judah, because of the offspring that the Lord will give you by this young woman. This is Judah, through whom the Lion of Judah, the Lion of the tribe of Judah will come. So the crowd doesn't fully realize the significance of what they're pronouncing, and yet the reader is supposed to pick up on the story, the tremendous theological significance. That out of the anonymity and obscurity of Ruth's foreign background, she has been adopted into the people of God, and through whom God has worked a wonderful plan and has a plan through her line, not only to build the house of Israel through King David, but bring to fulfillment the pronouncements made about the tribe of Judah, one who would reign forever, namely Jesus Christ himself. So again, there's a lot going on here. Now, what does Ruth get by this pronouncement? What these people are saying, are, are they saying that she's an outsider? No, they're saying she has now been accepted. So because of a transaction by Boaz, Ruth is now under a covenant relationship under the love of Boaz and has now find, found acceptance as a part, of, uh, a part of a people under Yahweh's wings and his providence. Now, perhaps you've begun to see the picture that is being painted here because we see a theological arc coming into the book of Ruth that really shows us what we just celebrated this past Easter, that Jesus Christ died on the cross. And in a transaction, he paid our debt and redeemed us out of the slave market of sin. And that not only has he redeemed us and purchased us, but he's made us his own and entered into a covenant relationship with those whom he has redeemed. And those whom he has redeemed now have the benefit of status as children of God, like Ruth is now the wife of Boaz. Under God's covenant protection and love, never to be forsaken. And as a result of this, this, this transaction, and also come out of the covenant love of God, we have found acceptance in the very presence of God, that we have been accepted to be his people forever. Just like here in the story, the people of Bethlehem accepted Ruth as their own, even as Boaz had transacted or redeemed her and brought her into a covenant protective relationship as his wife. So, so a lot going on. And if we can even play this out just maybe one step further, as the witnesses of Bethlehem looked on and affirmed that this transaction was complete, so has the Father, the Holy Spirit, Jesus Christ himself, the Holy Trinity, affirmed as witnesses that Jesus Christ's death and his resurrection were sufficient, that they affirmed the fact that the transaction has taken place and that we have been adopted into the family of God. So there's a lot of stuff going on in this passage, but it's lovely, isn't it? Teaching us about who our God is, teaching us about how he walks through life, and even in this story of Ruth, how he cares for individual, pe individual people to show them his love. Now, tomorrow and Friday, we're going to kind of wrap all of this up and see how God continues to fill his promises and fulfill his promises and specifically meet Naomi and Ruth where they're at and bless them and use them for something that is greater than what either one of them could possibly have imagined. Let's pray to this, this afternoon, this lunchtime, wherever you're at, at work or at home, or maybe this is in the evening or a couple days later, wherever you're at, let's pray. Let's thank God for his transaction of grace for redeeming us 
out of the slave market of sin. Father, we thank you for this day. We do ask your blessing upon it. May we remember the gospel truth of what you did for us on the cross. May we remember this short story in the Old Testament book of Ruth and how even then you were working to draw people from all corners of the earth to be your people. And I pray that you be with us tonight, bring us back safely and swiftly tomorrow as we open your word yet again. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless. Have a wonderful Wednesday.